Uh, a little bit later in our history, uh, we have uh, the development of Euclidean geometry, or actually maybe it was r roughly around the same time as the Constitution was written. Roughly speaking, non-Euclidean geometry was discovered by Carl Gauss and others at that time. And what they discovered is, of course, that the classical geometry of Euclid from ancient Greece, as brilliant as it was, you know, Euclid outlined all the postulates and axioms of geometry, and he was very rigorous in outlining all of these. And it was just assumed that geometry was done, set in stone. Geometry just is absolute. Until, of course, we started questioning it a little bit further, and we realized that all of Euclid's proofs and axioms and, and conclusions, they're all true relative to a flat plane. But on a sphere, it ain't true anymore. On some sta saddle-shaped surface, it ain't true. If we're talking about a four or five or ten dimensional geometric object, it doesn't behave according to Euclid's postulates and ideas. So entirely new geometries had to be invented, and that led to huge scientific and philosophical uh, revolutions. And then, of course, a little bit later, in the early 20th century, we had the development of quantum mechanics. And this was a huge relativistic breakthrough. Many people still don't understand the significance of quantum mechanics and what it really means as far as relativity goes. So the reason that quantum mechanics was relativistic was because what it showed is that measurement is not an absolute, but that measurement is entangled with the actual measuring instrument. So before quantum mechanics, what we assumed is that if I just take some physical object and I start measuring it, I'm measuring the actual physical object, and there it is, and my measurements are just objectively true. But what happened was when you started to bore deeper and deeper and deeper into reality itself, the very guts and fabric of it, you started to reach the point where it became impossible to distinguish the measuring instrument that you're using and the thing that you're measuring and that they are actually at, at all times entangled because you cannot divide the subject from the object. You're not some impartial observer. So when you're taking a microscope and you're looking at some molecule in that microscope, the actual photons of the microscope are affecting the molecule you're looking at and it's changing your measurement. So you can never say how an object actually is, what you must say is you might say, this is how object X appears when viewed through method or object Y. And there is no such thing as a particle. A particle is something you see when you look at an object a certain way. So it's not that there's a particle over here and then some measuring instrument over here. No, 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 no. What a particle is, is entangled with any measuring instrument that you're using, which is what generates the particle. Otherwise, what you have is you just have sort of a quantum soup, an indefinite, indistinct quantum soup, a sort of infinity from which the particle must be drawn out using some method of observation. So this was very counterintuitive, spooky, and paradoxical, and a lot of people didn't want to accept it. A lot of people still don't want to accept it. A lot of scientists still don't accept this. Even quantum physicists who are working in advanced universities today still do not accept the epistemic and metaphysical implications. Sure, they accept the results, but they don't accept, like the lab results, they accept that, but they don't accept the metaphysical and, and epistemic implications of what I'm saying here and of what the early founding fathers of quantum mechanics realized, what Niels Bohr and others like him realized. And if you want some more details on that, I have a multi-part series, two-part series called Quantum Mechanics Debunks Materialism, where we go into this in a lot of depth and I actually dissect uh, and give you quotations. It's very in-depth, so go check that out if you're really interested. Um, a lot of people still argue with me tell me that I don't understand quantum mechanics.
because that I'm presenting it in a relativistic fashion. And that in fact, Leo quantum mechanics never really demonstrated relativism. <laughs> That's simply because you, you don't really understand the metaphysics and the epistemology of quantum. You haven't thought about it deeply enough yet. It's extremely radical stuff. And even though some scientists do understand it, by and large, the implications, the metaphysical and epistemic implications of quantum mechanics have not percolated through into mainstream culture. People still generally believe that the world is made of particles, that particles exist independently of humans and measuring instruments, and that we can just talk about particles. You can't just talk about particles. This has been debunked for over a hundred years, yet most people go around and keep talking this way. Why is that? Because it makes no practical difference within the very limited context that they're living in. But actually, it does make a practical difference. You're just not aware of how. The way it makes a practical difference is that it solidifies your worldview into some materialistic worldview, some sort of absolutistic worldview. And this actually affects your ability to investigate reality and to discover who you are and to self-actualize, which is why we're talking about all this. All this connects directly back to your own personal development. You're not able to go deep enough in personal development unless you understand relativity, because you get stuck in some absolutist worldview perspective. Like you start to believe that you are a physical body and you never question that. It never occurs to you that that could be a relativistic notion. But <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Continuing on with the history, of course, we had soon after quantum mechanics, or even roughly at the same time, Einstein's general relativity, uh, where Einstein showed and proved, and this was borne out by many different experiments, that time, space, motion, and length are all relative. So literally, like I said with that Eiffel Tower example, the length of an object depends on your speed and your frame of reference to that object. There is no such thing as absolute space in the way that Isaac Newton thought. There is no absolute motion. Think about how significant this is. People still don't understand how significant and how radical Einstein's discoveries were. Sometimes people argue and they say, well, Leo, call, um, relativism, what are you talking about? Relativism, relativism, good and bad. Morality can't be relative, man. But even time and space and distance and length and motion have already been proven to be relative for over a hundred years. This has been demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt. And yet you still cling to some absolutist version of your culture as being superior or your religion as being superior or uh, your morality, your, your notion of good and bad as being absolute. Like, you're not thinking about this at all, are you? Time does not exist Space, motion, distance does not exist. But see, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because in your everyday experience, which is the thing that drives your whole worldview, it doesn't matter. You don't care about the truth. You don't care about what's real. You don't care about facts. What you care about is your perspective and how it allows you to survive. That's what you care about. You care about your ego. And your entire sense of physics and reality is completely serving your survival. You get this? Almost nobody gets this. Even scientists who should know better, they still don't get it. They get it theoretically but they don't actually get it in their own life. They don't get how significant it is. They haven't allowed it. They haven't allowed 
this knowledge to really transform their everyday consciousness. So in this sense, science is very stuck even still today. People are in denial about it. And notice that all throughout history, the name of the game is denial. Every time some new relativistic development happens, whether it's the discovery of the Americas or non-Euclidean geometry, there's always a large contingent of people which deny it, demonize it, attack it, reject it, ridicule it, and even harm and attack, violently attack those people who are uh, putting forth these discoveries. Right, because your worldview is at stake. And not just your worldview, but your very life is at stake. Because your life and your worldview are inseparable. You and your worldview are inseparable. You are your worldview. You don't just have a worldview, you are your worldview.